Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so I just want to say a few things before we get to uh, this afternoon's program. So I want to thank everyone for coming in person and also for the folks who are joining us online. Uh, so I'll say a little, a few, a little bit about this, Jim. I'm going to uh, talk about a few highlights that occurred uh, since our last anniversary again. Um, so ISGEM was founded in 2015 as the first university-wide institute um, studying and focusing on health disparities in LGBT, LGBTQ populations across the United States. So in the eight years that ISGEM has been around, our research is not only continuing, but it has continued to expand in ambition and impact. So our mission to improve the health and well-being of LGBTQ communities uh, continues to attract some of the best faculty, staff, and trainees in the country. This year, we welcome new faculty members, Annette Benbo, uh, Sue Jordan, Joshua Schrock, Madison Shea Smith, Christine Wood, and Alethea Samantakis. Um, Josh, Madison, and Alethea are all, as many people as you know, former history postdocs. And so we're really happy that they were able to continue their work with us and joining us as faculty. Sue Jordan um, is the Associate Director of Ishtim's newest research program, Advocate, SGM Health. And she co-leads it with the current director, Lauren Beach, who's here in the room with us today. The Advocate program uh, focuses on advocating for good health care and policy improvements in community and public health. The program has a special emphasis on health systems, health care, health, health equity, and within LGBTQ plus communities. So at ISGEN, we're really proud of our last standing commitment really to you know, mentor and train the future generations of LGBTQ or sexual and gender minority health scholars. Uh, we're now entering the second uh, application cycle for our newest uh, training program, our T33 Postdoctoral uh, post Fellowship, which is a highly competitive program that's funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health. We're also strengthening our commitment to supporting uh, BIPOC scholars. So uh, this past summer, we ran our second cycle of the summer intensive program in intersectional BIPOC and in focus on HIV science. That's a long title, right? Um, which I correct along with uh, faculty member Christina. And so um, one programming highlight I want to I want to focus on right now is really our annual state of sexual and gender minority health symposium that was held um, in collaboration with the with the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Educational Research Association. The symposium, which took place this year in Washington, DC, centered on advocating for the inclusion of LGBTQ plus individuals working and pursuing education in STEM fields and federal diversity initiatives. So I could really go on and on and talk about a lot of the highlights from the past year, but you know we want to get to like the program, right? And hear from our invited speaker. So um, at this point, I want to introduce our invited guest, uh, Dr. Liz McCollum, who is a PhD, who's a faculty member teaching primarily in the PhD program at Palo Alto University. They completed their doctor work in clinical community psychology at Paul University here in Chicago. She also completed a three-year uh, postdoctoral fellowship or F31 mechanism award um, from the National Institute on Drug Abuse here at ISCHA with uh, Dr. Burnett. And so uh, Dr. McConnell completed a doctoral fellowship internship, excuse me, at the University of Oregon Counseling Center, where they completed a rotation in training and supervision and served on the gender support services team. Um, Dr. McConnell's clinical interests include training and supervision, relational concerns, trauma-informed approaches, group therapy, and sexual and gender minority mental health. At Palo Alto University, she supervises students in the sexual and gender identities clinic within the Gronowski Center. Dr. McConnell is also a core member of the Center on Evidence-Based Life Research, or CLEAR as it's known. Their research focuses on, on relational and structural influences on the health and well-being of intersexually diverse sexual and gender minority populations using a variety of methodological approaches, including social network analysis and mixed analysis. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our discussant, Dr. Uh, Michelle Burkett, who is also a senior faculty here at Edition and director of the Connect Research Program. So please welcome uh, Drs. McConnell and Burkett for the presentation. I'm actually going to be quiet. I'm going to give this all to Liz, and I will help you some Q&A at the end. So, Liz, you can take it away. Hey, thank you both so much for that warm welcome and introduction. I feel like you've given my whole career trajectory now, <laughs> now that you know, <laughs> the presentation done. Uh, but it really is so special to be back here for Is Jim's eighth anniversary. And I noticed just kind of watching all of you file in with lunch, just really how good it feels seeing people gathering together in person, wishing I could be there in person. 
Um, I'm just so grateful to be able to be with you in, in whatever way I can right now. Um, so I wanted to first start off by acknowledging that my research program, but really my my entire career as I know it truly began at ISGEM, which is really saying something given that I um, you know, went to, did my PhD at DePaul in Chicago. Um, <laughs> but when I think about the impact ISGEM's had on my life and my career, uh, the set of relationships that I formed there really <laughs> rises to the forefront. And this, so it actually was a, 10 years ago this year that I started working with Isgem and with Michelle, um, which is a good chunk of time. And, you know, I was thinking mm -hmm. about how we reflect on time's <laughs> movement. And for I know, Michelle, you just get to watch your thumbs on a loop. <laughs> um, so 10 years, just to put that into perspective, I remember when Gregory Phillips came on board as like the new postdoc, which just <laughs> speaks to the mountains of work that have happened in that past decade. Um, and for me, my entry point into ISGEM was that I was at the end of my first year at DePaul. My advisor, um, Nathan Todd, who I'd come to work with around issues around engaging white folks in racial justice, had decided to move to a different university. And I was kind of like, where's my research home now? I was really kind of having a crisis about it. And there also wasn't anybody at DePaul doing LGBTQ-focused research. And I saw this ad for the IMPACT program offering a summer internship and threw in an application and was so lucky to get paired with Michelle. And that initial collaboration turned into five years of really powerful mentored work. Michelle helped me fall in love with network science and complex systems and really just invested in me in ways that I continue to be so grateful for. Um, and beyond the individual relationship with Michelle that was life-changing, it was also so powerful to just see what this level of infrastructure and community around sexual and gender minority health disparities can do. And um, I can still just like, I have a body memory of how good it felt to get off the elevator walking into ISGEM and like finding my space and seeing people around the office. So um, thank you all so much for that. Um, I'm gonna walk you through some of the key themes of my research, which again, um, really started at ISGEM. Um, and so I won't read through these now, I'll go through them one at a time, but I did just wanna acknowledge that my research reflects the broader ways that I tend to look at human experience in that I think many of our pain points come to us through interpersonal experiences of trauma and victimization, which can take so many forms. And so does our healing. Um, and that's part of why I find myself to be really an interpersonally oriented therapist in addition to a relationally focused researcher. So the first theme that I wanna talk about is this idea that intersectional diversity shapes our relationships. Um, and I hope that that's a thread that you'll see throughout the presentation today. So I'm just gonna kind of set up one way that I looked at this theme. Um, and this is the, so Project Voice was the F31 project that I did or my dissertation study. And what we did in that project was to take quantitative data, data primarily network and geospatial data um, from radar and to create visualizations and images from that quantitative data to show back to a subset of radar participants to get their reactions, their stories, their interpretations of the patterns we were finding in quantitative data. Um, and voice in this case stood for visualizing our identities, connections, and environments, but also just this act of giving voice to our participants' experiences in a deep kind of qualitative way. Um, and I, I, again, can kind of still flash back to being in interview rooms um, with those participants and just have such deep appreciation for the vulnerability they showed, the stories they gifted me with, the, the close lived experiences they trusted us with representing. Um, and this paper is um, probably the most kind of identity focused piece to come out of that work. Um, and I think what I wanna highlight here is the way in which participants really spoke to how intersectional their experiences of minority stress and privilege were. Um, so just to focus on a couple of um, themes around racism manifesting in context and sexual minority specific ways, the white guys in our study really talked about their whiteness as unremarkable. And they did that noting either that they just kind of weren't aware of whiteness and uh, didn't think about race or being really critically aware of the white privilege they carried in LGBTQ plus spaces and not feeling sort of marked or um, remarkable around their racial identities. 
And by contrast, the Black men in our study talked about repeated experiences of hypervigilance in LGBT spaces and in general spaces. And the overwhelming experience of Latino men was this experience of exotification um, in LGBT spaces. There were other intersectional themes that came up, but I just um, want to touch on, you know, the richness of participants' narratives and how all of these parts of themselves came together. The next theme I'll talk through is this idea that family relationships shape mental health. And this was one of the first bodies of work that I did at ISJM. Um, and yeah, felt really powerful for me as a, a queer kid grew up in the South with a family who struggled to be supportive, to be able to do work examining the role that family support played. And what we found here was that the presence or absence of family support for LGBTQ youth shaped mental health trajectories across adolescence and into young adulthood, even controlling for changes in their social support across later waves. So really, whether or not they had that family support at age 17 had lasting impacts on mental health. And then some more recent work that I've done in this area as with a colleague, M. Matsuno, who's now at ASU, and we looked at um, quantitative and qualitative responses of parents of trans kiddos looking at what barriers and supports they identified to being supportive of their trans and non-binary kids. And uh, you can see here that the both the supports over here, or sorry, the barriers over here on the left and the supports over here on the right are highly multi-level. So some of them were within parent factors like beliefs, attitudes, feelings, knowledge, skills, but some of them were related to relationships, resources, systems level processes, right? And for me, this just reminds me of the importance of thinking about and enacting change on multiple levels. I also think it's really important to examine our relationships in community and how these can be a source of resilience. And so another study that we did at ISGEM looked at experiences of both racial and ethnic stigma in LGBT spaces here in the darker bars, as well as people's experiences of LGBT stigma in their neighborhood. And I think the finding I really wanna highlight here is just the prevalence of anti-Black racism in LGBTQ spaces and um, how salient that was for the Black sexual minority men in our study. Um, but interestingly, when we looked at the role that connection to LGBT community played, mm -hmm in mediating the relationship between stigma and stress, we found that uh, BIPOC sexual minority men, and we did have to aggregate all BIPOC folks together into this model, um, were more resilient in their connection to LGBTQ community. So even though they were experiencing this stigma in LGBT spaces, they weren't feeling less connected because of it, which I think is, you know, again, speaks to the resilience there and being able to make use of community in different ways. The next theme I wanted to name is that relationships are moving online, right? And so thinking about relationships is happening in lots of different kinds of spaces. And this image is one of my favorites from my time at ISGEM and it illustrates uh, around like 250 Facebook networks of LGBTQ youth. Um, this is actually from Project Q2. Um, the nerd in me wants to celebrate that these look like little Petri dishes, but they actually represent macro level relational structure. So it's like something big that looks like something really small. And while I loved, um, so I, I was a research assistant on this study and helped generate these visualizations in interviews with participants to talk about their experiences and talk about their online relationships. Um, and while I love kind of the individuality and beauty and the meaning that you can make of each of these images, it's sort of hard to wrap your mind around any patterns or trends in this image. So in another study that we did, we first identified ways of kind of simplifying that sample of folks. And we chose to do that by looking at these sort of uh, types based on different outness profiles and then aggregating and visualizing their Facebook network connections so that we could understand them in a more macro level way. And we did that by um, having participants sort the groups in their Facebook networks into these different categories, and then visualizing the connection between those categories of relationships in their lives. So if you look at these images, you might see that one of them is a little bit different than the others. And what we found here is that folks who were low in their overall outness, um, and I, I will acknowledge this kind of challenged a bias that I held, were actually some of the most connected in terms of their connection to LGBTQ community and family. 
those groups were really represented in their Facebook networks. Perhaps unsurprisingly, they were somewhat least connected to family in their Facebook networks. So kind of keeping families separate from the rest of their relational worlds online. And then interestingly, uh, there was a high degree of connectivity between their schools and their neighborhoods. So also perhaps thinking, you know, it's, it's hard to know exactly what to make of that, but that these might be folks who are more geographically embedded and that have their networks maybe going to community college or in school somewhere close to where they live. Uh, so maybe says something, their online relationships may say something about their physical space and their physical relationships. And that brings me, oh, not quite yet, <laughs> jumping ahead of theme. Um, so in another um, layer of project voice, as we were visualizing people's relationships in online spaces, we looked at the apps where different uh, men who have sex with men of different races and ethnicities met partners in uh, the radar data. And what we found, so in this image, green represents majority white apps, red represents majority Latina apps, and blue represents majority black apps. And what we found is that white participants were overwhelmingly meeting their sex partners in majority white apps, whereas Latino and black participants were bridging a lot more apps to meet partners and make connections. And that's a theme that will kind of carry through in some of the other images I'll show you. So if we transition from online space to physical space, and I'm, I'm joining you all today with a cold, so please bear with me as I might take some water breaks and hopefully, hopefully no coughs. Um, but relationships are also embedded in physical space. Uh, this hopefully looks quite familiar to many of you in this room, right? This is the city of Chicago. And the image here on the left shows essentially racial segregation in Chicago um, with just the um, kind of majority race or ethnicity of each of the Chicago community areas. And what we found when we looked at the venues where men who have sex with men in the radar data met their partners, we found very similar patterns to what we found when we were looking at apps in that white participants exclusively met their partners in majority white neighborhoods, whereas black and Latino par uh, participants were meeting partners in venues from around the city. And this isn't represented here, but in the qualitative data, often reported traveling long ways or having strong ties with a number of different neighborhoods based on different parts of themselves. In addition to that bridging pattern, I just wanna highlight the role that North Halstead plays in bringing together men who have sex with men of different races and ethnicities um, in a pattern that we, we later uh, called mixing that many participants referred to. And then this image reflects, you know, if we wanted to take space out of it and just look at, mm -hmm. do we see that um, in that pattern of insularity and bridging, looking at the relational connections. So this represents um, sex connections between MSM who live in different neighborhoods at the neighborhood level. Do we still see those same trends? And the answer was, yes, we do. So over here, you'll see that all the green or majority white neighborhoods are kind of clumped together and highly connected to each other whereas majority black and majority Latino neighborhoods are much more connected across the neighborhood network. Uh, and these bigger um, nodes here represent higher between the centrality, showing that they play a role in connecting neighborhoods that are otherwise disconnected. So in a few different ways, right, we saw that um, those, those racial themes of experiences of physical space in the city. And this is where I really want to celebrate methodological diversity and acknowledge that qualitative and mixed methods can provide rich perspective on some of these complex questions. Because one of my favorite parts of Project Voice is when we took those images back and showed them to participants and, and engaged in some storytelling. And what did we learn? And um, before I get into a couple of quotes, I just want to highlight at a sort of big picture level that, uh, so this image shows code co-occurrence. So, how often was it that these two kinds of codes were applied to the same unit of text? And you can see here that the highest level of code co-occurrence was between structural factors and intersectional identities. So it was really clear throughout the stories that participants were giving to us that those structural factors that we all know play a really important role in driving uh, racial disparities in HIV were really intertwined with people's identities. And so you might wonder kind of what structural factors. I'm not going to talk you through all of the different structural factors that we identified in the study because there were a lot. 
But just to give you exam an example of one um, kind of cluster of them, uh, participants talked about a number of different neighborhood dynamics, including racial segregation, uh, insularity. So, uh, you know, I've talked about the white insularity piece, uh, bridging. Uh, so moving between different neighborhoods, mixing, so people of different backgrounds or identities coming together in certain spaces, and then gentrification, which was especially um, prominent for Latino participants. And uh, I, I think this quote on the, high, on the right highlights the importance of acknowledging how it's not just racial segregation, but also the resource inequity associated with racial segregation. So this participant says, I feel a lot of things about the racial segregation. Well, not the segregation, but the opportunities in certain neighborhoods and the education system in certain neighborhoods and the overall lack of certain neighborhoods. In some neighborhoods, the upkeep is better than other neighborhoods and other neighborhoods are just left for shot. You can see that when you cross certain borders. I also wanted to highlight another theme that came up as a structural factor that for me, um, I think represented one of my biggest learnings in this study, which was that over half of our Black participants named policing as a structural factor that shaped where they went in the city and where they spent time with people. And this was a spontaneous theme, meaning that we did not ask any questions specifically about policing. The kinds of questions we asked were like, where do you go to spend time with friends? Where do you go to meet partners? What is it that you like about those spaces? What is it like to be in those spaces? So very open-ended. Um, but policing came through loud and clear as something that was shaping participants' experiences. And this participant powerfully um, highlights this. They can, tell, they can tell you one thing up north and they'll tell you nicely or they'll say, move along. And on my side of town, you know, you're walking up and down the street and the police, they want to ask you a question. They don't pull you over and ask you a question. They want to shine lights on you and, you know, put your hands up and do all that crazy stuff. They definitely respond differently on the west and south side versus, you know, when I'm up north. People can, you know, be walking up and down the street. They can be drunk. You know, on my side of the town, you can be walking down the street and be stumbling and the police will pull you over. And this was just one excerpt of many um, that came through in the study of, of people highlighting how powerful this was in shaping their experiences, which, again, I think just speaks to the importance of um, having community engaged methods and um, you know, just involving the people that we are conducting research about and with in multiple stages of research um, processes. And, and for me, definitely highlighted a bias that I had as a white researcher of not imagining that this would be a theme coming in and asking these open-ended questions. Okay, so I, I hope that takes you through sort of a high level of um, my research programs so far. But I, I really appreciated that part of this invitation was also to speak to kind of where have our professional journeys taken us kind of during and following our time at ISGEM. And so for me, I was at ISGEM for five years from 2013 to 2018. And then in that 2018 to 2019 year, I moved across the country to do my internship at the University of Oregon in Eugene. Um, and for me, that decision was really about, it, it was a tricky decision. I, I did a lot of personal discernment around it. Um, and I think that it was about, I've always been a person who values research, teaching, clinical practice, advocacy, I mean, just about any of the roles that we can have uh, for me as a psychologist. And um, it's always been hard for me to choose and center one of those. And I ended up at the end of my time in graduate school feeling like I had gotten a lot of really excellent research training at ISGEM. But my program didn't have a ton of clinically focused courses, and I, I didn't feel like I quite found my identity as a clinician. And I think I was still really kind of hungering for a clinical capstone experience. Um, and I knew I loved working with transitional age youth, and I knew that university counseling centers were a place where I could work with queer and trans transitional age youth. Um, and um, I knew I was drawn to sort of more interpersonal interventions and, and approaches. Um, and so that was a really strong match for me with the University Counseling Center um, in Oregon and really was everything that I, I could have hoped for in those respects. That year, I really found my clinical practice from an experiential, interpersonal and trauma informed approach. Um, and it was kind of in that way, like finding my water as a clinician, not, not to knock like CBT. I also use CBT in my work with people, but really CBT had been the only model that supervisors had kind of trained and equipped me with up until this point. And so this just opened whole new doors for me. 
Um, I also got to supervise uh, for the first time. And I always kind of had the suspicion that I would love supervision, but I really found that out to be true on internship year. Um, so I'm, I'm so glad I made that choice and that I um, had that clinical training experience and somewhat embarrassingly will acknowledge that my enthusiasm for internship is like forever commemorated in a video on their internship uh, page. This is like a <laughs> from that video where I just like gush over and over about what a positive training year I was having, um, which I know isn't true for many people. Um, and on that year, I did a number of LGBTQ focused projects. Um, so the first thing was that I built a relationship with the coordinator for LGBTQ education and support services and talked to them about what students were needing and how the counseling center could help. And the initial project that we identified was that they could really use some support for students who had unsupportive families, that when they got towards the holiday season, many faculty and university staff assumed that that was a period of relief and rest for students, but that for students going home to families who weren't supportive, that was absolutely not true. And so we designed a workshop series um, to engage and support queer and trans students and preparing to go home for the holidays. The second layer was that I joined the gender support services team. We did a lot of kind of primary work around providing letters of support for folks seeking medically affirming services um, and also just provided trans affirming therapy with gender expansive clients. But we also did other things like advocating with local insurance companies to follow ethical practice in providing letters of support, like not um, kind of overly assessing people in unnecessary ways or providing education about that process. Um, supporting staff through consultation, those kinds of things. And then the Home for the Holidays workshop series turned into an ongoing relationship with UO that continues to this day. Um, so they have an LGBTQ academic residential community or ARC. And just about every year I go back and do one or two workshops. Um, we've done topics on coping during, during COVID lockdown for people with unsupportive families on the importance of chosen family and cultivating relational resilience um, for LGBTQ people. And then the last project that I did in this vein um, as a systems kind of thinker and also a researcher was using university counseling center data um, to demonstrate that national health disparities trends were also present locally. And part of why this is important, excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip of water. Mm -mm. Part of why this is important is that UO had a narrative that they kind of got it right when it came to LGBTQ students, that those students weren't struggling and that they had the support they needed. And um, in talking with folks engaged in that student advocacy in the university, they said it would be really helpful to have data demonstrating what they were hearing from students. And not only did we see that our sexual and gender minority clients at the counseling center had higher levels of a number of mental health conditions. But we also saw that plurisexual folks, trans folks, and interestingly, people who did not want to provide information about their sexual orientation or gender diversity on intake were really struggling. And then they were able to use that to advocate. <coughs> Thank you all for your patience. My whole household has gotten taken out by this, this little crud. And interestingly, my six month old baby was the first one to get it. So we all are like, well, where did this come from? We don't know. So after internship year, I joined the faculty at Palo Alto University. And <clears throat> that for me, that decision was um, kind of came for a number of different reasons and was another period of discernment for me about career trajectory. And I made a pact with myself that when I looked for my next place after internship, that I was only going to apply at places where I felt like a genuine sense of congruence and enthusiasm. And this turned out to be the one job posting that I saw that year. I, I will say it was kind of easy to take that stance when um, I knew I could stay at the University Counseling Center for postdoc for another year if I wanted to. Um, but these were some of the characteristics I saw in PAU that really attracted me as a, a junior faculty member. So they had this balance of research, teaching, and practice. And I knew I liked to do all of those different things. 
They operated from an explicit values-based place engaged in social justice and community values. Um, they have a very large graduate student program. So although there's a lot of student mentorship involved in my job, it's primarily with PhD students. And that's really congruent for me. And then the specific position that I came into had a focus on clinical supervision and training, which I knew I loved. And PAU has an area of emphasis and a, a lot of infrastructure around LGBTQ psychology. So I'm going to talk you through a few different uh, roles that I have at PAU that have really built upon some of the expertise that I gained at ISGEM and allowed me to expand it in very values congruent ways. Um, and this is probably, I don't, it's one of my favorite roles that I have at PAU is being the director of and a clinical supervisor within the Sexual and Gender Identities Clinic or the SGIC. And so the SGIC is our in-house, it's one of our in-house university training clinics. It's uh, embedded within the Gronowski Center, which also has Clinica Latina for Spanish speaking services. Um, and we provide sliding scale uh, affordable therapy in a sort of community mental health model in a very expensive part of the country for, for obtaining therapy services. And furthermore, we train student therapists on providing LGBTQ plus affirmative therapy. So that for me has been a great gift of my time at PAU so far. And since becoming the director, these are a few of the initiatives that I um, have carried out. So the first was formalizing our curriculum. Uh, when I came in, it was kind of um, trainings happened on an as needed basis, but we didn't really have a thoughtful education progression. So I sort of watched what we needed for a year or two and then um, got student feedback and created an annual education progression with weekly topics for group supervision as well as starting an intensive training program where we get together all of our students in the SGIC four times a year for um, these intensive trainings that build on themselves. We also founded an advanced practicum program where students in later years of the program can complete a supplemental practicum and they have a, a kind of more defined role with us in terms of providing letters of support for gender affirming medical services. And one of the projects I'm really proud of there is that one of our advanced prac trainees worked with one of our supervisors to do a lit review of best practices and create a guide for our student therapists on how to um, engage in that process in a thoughtful, uh, but not unnecessarily restrictive way. Um, these students also engage in program improvement projects. Um, so they're trained in kind of thinking about program improvement and advocacy and coming up with a project that they think would benefit the SGIC and developing that over the course of the year. And they provide peer supervision and engage in training with us for our more junior students. We've also grown a lot. So when I first joined PAU in 2019, we had 11 student therapists. And this year we have 22 student therapists. Um, and we serve over 100 clients annually, primarily low SES folks and over 50% people of color. And I say people of color instead of BIPOC intentionally because in this part of the Bay Area, we have in some ways an underrepresentation of Black clients but many Asian and Latina clients. Um, well, there was something else I wanted to say about this. Oh, just, just to note, you know, sometimes, uh, yeah, I, I, over the years, I think I've supervised 23 student therapists in the SGIC, which is a higher supervision load than there are in many places. But for me, that's also just been a really powerful part of this role, knowing that I, I got to walk with student therapists in their first year of providing services along in that vulnerable journey as they develop their identities, learn how to serve this client, this client population in affirming ways. And then, you know, hopefully have a ripple impact in terms of what kinds of services are out there and the training that they'll go on to do throughout their careers. And then the last big initiative in the SGIC has been focused on creating community, both within the SGIC by having these quarterly all SGIC trainings, but also networking with local and regional organizations to let them know what we do and who we're a good fit with. Um, and right now I'm working on creating an alumni network so that our current students can reach out to people who've trained in the SGIC in the past, sort of like this, lovely idea you all, um, and uh, connect with alumni as resources. Another project that's come out of my work in the SGIC was that I noticed a high degree of overlap between um, the trans clients we were seeing and neurodiverse and specifically autistic clients. And <coughs> excuse me, turns out I'm not the only one to notice this. 
Um, so, you know, more and more we are learning that there is a strong intersection between trans and non-binary and autistic identities and experiences. And for me, coming from a program that didn't provide a lot of training around autism and where the training that I did get was very firmly rooted in a pathology paradigm, this was a place where I felt I needed to learn new tools. And so this is a paper I co-authored with Reese Minshew, who's also an ISGEM alumni. And we looked at uses of feminist therapy with this population. <clears throat> I also have had the opportunity um, kind of post uh, PhD to expand into relationship therapy, which has always been an interest of mine. So I've completed advanced training in emotionally focused therapy and the Gottman method. I started seeing my own relationship therapy clients in the SGIC, supervising relationship therapy clients. Um, and through that work and learning from the clients that we see in the SGIC, it became really clear to me how important it was that we operate from a relationship diversity affirming stance. So many of our clients are in consensually non-monogamous or polyamorous relationships. And that's another place where I feel our field and the training that I received was really lagging behind. So we try to provide a lot of intentional training to our students about, um, you know, being inclusive of relationship diversity. And I also joined the Committee on Consensual Non-Monogamy through Division 44 as one of the co-leads of the LGBTQ CNM intersection. And I'm getting to work with the lovely Madison, uh, who's the current ISGEN faculty member through that work, which has been delightful. <clears throat> so another role that I have at PAU is through the Center for LGBTQ Evidence-Based Applied Research, or CLEAR. And I think the big project I wanna highlight here is the LGBTQ Plus Clinical Academy. This is a project that um, Kim Balsam is the PI of, and I'm the co-PI. And I think the structure of it is, is really pretty cool. Give me one. So, um, in California, we have this Mental Health Services Act funding, which is basically a tax on millionaires that funds mental health services. And the funding for this project comes from that. And we have groups of um, around 30 to 35 participants who sign up for a 40 hour intensive training focused on LGBTQ affirmative work. We are now in our fourth year, which has been fantastic. Um, and we've expanded to offering a mini academy and advanced training topics. And we also have an evaluation component to this work. So we're currently looking at evaluating our training outcomes as we built our sample over these four years. It's really been a, a privilege to work with master's level clinicians who are in the field providing services and hearing on the ground feedback about what's needed. Um, and then uh, last but not least, another important aspect of my role at PAU is that I'm the PI of the Relational and Ecological Aspects of LGBTQ Lives or Real Lives Lab. I like this name because it also reminds me of like a reality show from the 90s maybe. And um, as a clinician, it keeps me grounded in the fact that the people that we do research about and with are real people and that we should honor that and hold that close as we, um, as we do this work. I won't read through these, but these are our lab's guiding values. And um, if you're curious to learn more about us, this is all listed on our website. I hope you've seen many of these themes and some of the pieces that I've talked with you about today. One thing we did last year that I was um, excited to do, especially as somebody who started a faculty position six months before COVID hit, is that we got to go to a real conference in person and do a symposium on integrating intersectionality into training, supervision, and clinical practice with LGBTQ folks. And then we had a number of um, presentations within that symposium focused on specific intersections of the LGBTQ plus umbrella based on student interests. I wanna highlight some of the student work that's coming out of our lab that I'm so proud of. Um, so Marielle Alano is a, a more senior student in our lab who's doing, to our knowledge, the first study of the mental health experiences of trans Filipino Americans. Uh, it's a qualitative study. Chico Fudu is doing a, another qualitative study. Um, it's a narrative examination of the mental health help seeking processes of black women. And as part of this work, they've been really intentional about recruiting an intersectionally diverse sample of black women um, and looking at mental health needs and suggestions to inform outreach to this population, which we know is so important. 
And then Emily Wojcik is doing um, a study with secondary data set looking at the relationships between childhood gender nonconformity, psychological distress, and social well-being across three different cohorts um, from Ilan Meyer's generation study. Um, and then we have a number of other fantastic lab members doing work that I'm really so, so proud of. Um, and all of these folks are doctoral level students. So again, at PAU, student mentorship is a big part of my role. Um, and it feels very values congruent for me that it's um, students in that graduate um, stage of training. And it's just been such a gift to meet and work with these wonderful individuals who remind me why I do what I do. Uh, in another kind of full circle, experience. I'm delighted that my relationship with his gym is not past tense, <laughs> but um, I've had ongoing collaborations with his gym and kind of most um, immediately, most salient, um, continue to work with Michelle as um, the co-lead of, um, through CHISPIG, um, the, the CAB, the Community Advisory Board, but then through a grant submission that just went in, fingers crossed, send good vibes to Michelle and also please help her take care of herself because I think that just went in yesterday. <laughs> so she's probably in need of some support and encouragement. Um, this, this grant looking at structural inequities across layers of social context as drivers of HIV and substance use. Um, I'm doing this work as a co-lead with Darnell Motley, who I hope many of you know, is just um, went to grad school with and, and such a wonderful person. Um, and really excited to be in this role that for me feels so values congruent in terms of thinking about how we translate our theory and research into action and making sure that we're doing research in community engaged ways. And I just want to hat tip Michelle for taking that lens with system science um, and, you know, some of these complex models that she's running that I think is a, a kind of subfield where it's easy for people to, to move away from that community engaged approach. And I wanted to just close by talking a little bit more about my personal journey. Um, you know, so I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. I came out here when I was like 14 in the late 90s. Um, I, I had a family that didn't always know how to support me in the best ways. And kind of like many people, I think, who are queer and trans who come into mental health, it was sort of my own experiences as a teenager um, and positive experiences with mental health professionals, thankfully, that inspired me to begin a journey into graduate school. And that took me to Chicago, where about 10 years ago, I um, was fortunate enough to kind of find a seat at the table at ISGEM, which again has changed my life in so many ways. And then from there, um, came out West, first to internship and then down South to California. I loved being out West. I, there's a, you know, I, I kind of envisioned myself ending up back out on the West Coast, but I think life also has seasons. And one of the seasons, um, you know, that has been active for me recently is that, um, well, I had a, a baby six months ago, so that's been pretty life-changing. Um, and then my mom had cancer a few years back and that cancer came back as stage four. And for me, it sort of um, felt like an invitation from life to center family and to remember that my life can be more than just my professional roles. And so this year, the 23-24 academic year, I transitioned to a remote position and found myself back in Charleston, which is where I'm joining you from today, um, so that I could be with my mom and, um, you know, let her get to know her first grandchild. And uh, of course, the logical way to do that would have been to follow this route that Google suggested, but we did not do that. My partner and I um, decided that we would take the summer to, we bought this 1972 trail night camper and with our two and a half month old as brand new parents set up off like up the coast um, all the way to Vancouver. And then my partner is from Canada. So we saw a lot of her family across Canada, made it all the way to Halifax. Um, and then down the coast of South Carolina. So I think it was 8,850 miles over two and a half months with a two and a half month old and two dogs in this, um, I don't know, approximately 60 square foot camper. So this is us on the West Coast. And this is where we are now here on the East Coast. Um, but for me, it just, you know, I think it's such a reminder that um, really, truly, like the journey is the destination. And I am so grateful for all of the detours and unexpected places that mine has taken me and very much still feel in process with that. You know, I, I'm not quite sure what my next professional direction is, but I know in my bones and in my heart that the chapter is um, has changed. Like I, I would not be on this journey without that time. And I am just so, so, so grateful um, to you all. So on your eighth anniversary, I just want to say thank you for the gift that you've given me um, through all of the support that you um, have provided my own trajectory and this room full of people that um, is getting that support in different ways. 
So thank you so much and happy to entertain any questions or comments folks might have. Thanks for bearing with the cough. Liz, thank you so much. Um, we have just a couple of minutes for some questions. Um, one thing I just want to throw out there, and I'm sure everybody in this room has, has gotten this through the presentation, is that Liz is a force of nature. And like, if, if it wasn't enough to just um, see in all of the different ways that Liz has succeeded across research, clinical work, advocacy, um, mentorship, all of these things, um, taking a, a two and a half month old across the country, I think also solidifies that. Um, when I first met Liz, I was very lucky. I, was, I just recently um, moved into a faculty position and met Liz. And when I, when I met them, I was like, you have to focus. You need to like pare it down. Cause I was talking to Liz as if I, like that's how I need to function in the world. <laughs> um, and then I quickly realized, no, actually like Liz does best when they're like in this, like, you know, in the stew of everything, like sort of like, you know, the chaos of everything. And that's really where they thrive. Um, and so it's been such a pleasure to work with them. Um, if anybody has questions, I would love to, to offer that, but maybe just to start, I'm just wondering, Liz, do you have any, I guess, advice for any budding SGM researchers that might be in this room? What advice do you have for folks if they're trying to start their own careers? Thanks so much for that question, Michelle. Um, I mean, there's so much that comes up. I think I think part of it is what you named, which I, I really struggled with, and is that piece about, um, you know, kind of finding your own authentic path, because I think, and I think that's true for everyone, that it's, you know, the, the metaphor I use with students in clinical supervision is that having different supervisors is like living on different planets for a year, and each of those opportunities is a chance to kind of understand that complex ecosystem. And some of those planets might have very different ecosystems. And hopefully at the end of that year, you have a sense of what parts of it really resonate for you and what parts just don't fit with who you are. And that over time you get to kind of build your own planetary ecosystem. Um, and so to try to both keep like an openness to learning new things and to come back to discernment and self-knowledge about what is a good fit for you. And one of the, the reasons I'm so grateful for Michelle's mentorship is that she found that delicate balance. Because when I started graduate school, I thought I wanted to go into private practice, like a solo private practice. I was terrified of statistics. I did not think I wanted to do research. And then I like met Michelle and also, yeah, just like fell in love with network methods was like, you can actually use statistics and these quantitative tools to answer questions that I'm deeply passionate about, like, please bring me on board. Um, and so I'm so grateful both for sort of like the openness and sponginess to explore new directions. And also for that sort of give and take of over time figuring out, like, what is the right path, you know, for for you, which only you can can kind of know inside yourself. Any questions? One question I have for you, Liz, is, you know, you kind of mentioned it when you talked about like getting off the elevator and that like feeling of like coming into ISGEM and like having that community. Could you talk a little bit about just um, the importance of having space where you have folks who are doing SGM work, where you have that community um, and, and kind of relatedly the importance of also like being around researchers who are in that space as well. I just like, I just like sighed in my body when you asked that question, Michelle, like it was like a body experience of, you know, I think I, for so many of us with minoritized identities, you often don't realize the weight that you're carrying until you're not carrying it for a minute. And then it's like, whoa, I didn't know that was with me. And um, it was just so transformative being at ISGEM, having you know, queer and trans folks be more at the center, feeling like I didn't have to translate parts of my identity, like I could envision paths that I hadn't been able to envision before that time. Um, you know, so I just, I think there's something so powerful about the sort of critical mass and resources and infrastructure that ISGEM has developed. And I know that it's taken a lot of 
um, strong leadership and um, advocacy and intentional planning and just so many spirits and so many minds and bodies working in so many ways to build to build that community. Um, so it just I, I think that's so powerful and um, and then I think you know since that time I feel really lucky to to have found an institution where I'm not the only person right I'm not like the only person doing queer and trans focused research. I'm not the only person um, centering intersectionality. Like, um, and I think that has been vital as an early career person that that has really helped me to feel less alone and to feel, you know, I'm not at like an is gym level place, but I'm also not siloed. Uh, and I think depending on what kinds of settings you find yourself in, just remembering that you can stay connected to community in so many different ways and that you're not alone and trying to keep some of those strong resources and networks active because they really can be lifelines. We only have another minute. Um, unless anybody has another question, I, I'm really just curious, Liz, like are there things that you know were surprising as you sort of set off in your academic career um, away from ISGEM? Like anything that really surprised you that you weren't describing? Oof. I could almost spend a whole nother hour on that question. So I'm trying to think of how to, I think how, how things are just so different in different places. I will say being at a university that we don't have a lot of, um, you know, kind of need to secure external funding at PAU because we are primarily tuition driven. And that comes with just trade-offs. Um, so I don't think, you know, it's not that one's better or worse, but um, yeah, just, just that there are so many different kinds of settings out there. And, and um, I think, I, I, again, it's another thing I'm grateful for from having been at ISGEM that I think it almost makes you multilingual to experience different kinds of settings and to be familiar on some level with like what some of the strengths and liabilities of different contexts you might find yourself in are. Yeah. Um. I think that concludes it for today, folks. Um, just one more, maybe hand up a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's really, really lovely to be with you all. And I, I don't imagine many of you, well, if you find yourself in Charleston, please let me know. I also anticipate being back on the West Coast and hope our paths cross in many unexpected ways. <laughs>